Melchizedek destroys the Trinity. I'm going to show you that in this study today. Um, it has been a real shame for me as I've studied this subject. I had this, this, this is a sermon request going way back. Could you please do a sermon on who is Melchizedek in the scriptures, Old Testament, New Testament. So we're going to look at all the references today in this study. But as I've been studying for this thing, it's been really a shame for me to see that the Bible is just crystal clear about who Melchizedek is. And yet so many preachers are afraid to say who he is, who Melchizedek is, because of their Trinitarian beliefs. You see, if you are a Trinitarian, then you have to reject the scriptures about who Melchizedek is. Um, it's absolutely shameful what these guys do because the, the Bible is crystal clear who Melchizedek is. Okay, it's Jesus. I'm going to pro prove that in this study today. And uh, we're going to learn a lot of things here. It's a very interesting study. And uh, I do, do believe that in the time of Jacob's trouble, that the book of Hebrews is going to be preached. You can turn in your Bible to Genesis chapter 14 a while. I do believe that, that the book of Hebrews is going to be preached to the Jews, and I believe it's going to be preached by Moses and Elijah, um, the two witnesses of Revelation chapter 11. And one of the biggest hurdles that you have when dealing with Jews is the Trinitarian teaching. You see, because they are expecting a Messiah that is both father and son, according to Isaiah 9.6. Um, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our, our God is one Lord. They're not expecting three. Okay? They're looking and they're saying, Father and Son are one. All right? If they really understand the Scriptures. And I realize there's a lot of, you know, rabbinical tra traditions and other junk that's entered in that's really messed them up and they don't really follow the Scriptures, a lot of the different sects of Judaism. But the fact of the matter is, um, there are some prophecies in the Old Testament. We're going to be looking at one of them here. Um, very important one that simply could not be fulfilled by a Trinitarian Jesus. Let me prove it to you. Genesis chapter 14, we're going to look at the very first time that Melchizedek shows up. And it's spelled Melchizedek with a Z and a K in the Old Testament and with an S and a C in the New Testament, just to clear up any confusion. Genesis chapter 14, verses 18 through 20. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed, blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. Abraham gave him tithes, in other words, Melchizedek. Um, and I've seen this thing, and I've seen guys, and they'll say, Well, you know, it could be Shem. I think it could be Shem because, you know, they have to reject the other scriptures. Now, I'll have mercy on you if you're Jewish and all you have is an Old Testament because the Old Testament really doesn't identify who Melchizedek is. But if you're a Christian and you say that this could be Shem, uh, you got some serious problems. Uh, and again, it's because of your Trinitarian system of belief. Um, the Bible's clear. In the book of Hebrews, we're going to be going there. It's going to be showing that Melchizedek is Jesus. But how can you make this into Shem? All right? It's ridiculous, especially when you compare it with you know, the book of Hebrews, chapter 7, um, verse 3 especially, which we'll be covering. But, um, you know, it says that he gave him tithes of all. Why on earth would Abraham there, Abram at that time, why would he give Shem tithes? Kind of weird. <laughs> okay? It's not Shem. Let me show you here another, the prophecy. Psalm 110. Psalm 110. Turn your Bible to the book of Psalms. The other reference to Melchizedek in the Old Testament. There's only two of them. Psalm 110 and verse 4. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Um, this is a prophecy about this priest, the high priest there of Melchizedek. Right? And the Lord's saying he's sworn this and he's not going to repent. He's not going to change his mind on this. There isn't some kind of thing of, oh, well, you know, we had to change up some things. So eh, I'm going to kind of change the identity of Melchizedek there. No, he's sworn and he won't repent. God can't lie. All right, that's very important to get. Now let's go to the book of Hebrews. 
Now's where it ties in. Who is Melchizedek? Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, beginning in verse 5. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Who is it? Who is Melchizedek? Christ. Very clear. And we'll see it gets even clearer here as we continue. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and it was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Okay, stop there for a minute. Look at verse 7. In the days of his flesh. Hmm. Did uh, Abram see a flesh and blood man there? Melchizedek? Yeah, obviously. He sees him, he's giving him ten, you know, tithes and things, and Melchizedek is bringing bread and wine and, and things like this. Of course he had a body back then. It wasn't some soul that just kind of manifested or something like that. No, he had a body. But what does it mean there in the days of his flesh? When he took on corruptible flesh, when he became Jesus Christ. Hmm. So, you see, Melchizedek didn't change in the sense of, oh, now he's, he was Shem, but now he's Jesus. No, 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 no. It's Jesus. Jesus had a body in the Old Testament, a physical body, which we're going to see here in just a few minutes. I'm going to prove it to you. He had a physical body, but it wasn't corruptible flesh. But here, verse 7, in the days of his flesh, talking about the Garden of Gethsemane there, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. You see? And was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Okay? He comes as a son at that point in time. You see, was there any reference to him being a son before then? We'll see that. Verse 9. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. See? Obey him there in the time of Jacob's trouble. There's some works involved there. It's faith and works. Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 12 proves that. Okay? But notice, he is the author of eternal salvation. So, um, how could it be Shem? All right? Uh, no, it's not Shem. And Melchizedek isn't some special being that's up in heaven apart from the Godhead. No, Melchizedek is Jesus Christ. He is a priest forever. And when does forever begin, by the way? Hmm. Verse 10, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. Yeah, it's going to be a time that Moses and Elijah are going to have dealing with the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. It's going to be a real time with them. That's a lot of uh, traditions of men that they're going to have to erase and say, yeah, we got to get rid of that thing. And um, all this Trinitarian stuff that you guys have heard from like, the Catholic Church that's persecuted the Jews. Oh, uh, yeah, that's all nonsense. Uh, we're going to have to get rid of all that thinking there, that Jesus Christ and, the, and God the Father are two different persons, two different beings. Uh, it's not true. I'm going to prove it. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 20. Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Who is Melchizedek? Who is the priest made after the order of Melchizedek? Jesus. It's Jesus. Well, we think it could be Jesus, but we're not really sure. I'm not really... Okay, Trinitarians, I'm going to show you out there why Trinitarians have to reject that it's Jesus or at least put a little question mark there. Well, I think it could be Jesus, but it, you know, and they have to get all philosophical and things. I'm going to show you. Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 through 2. For this Melchizedek, okay? See, you could make the argument, priest after the order of Melchizedek, but Melchizedek is somebody else. Here's Melchizedek, but near a priest of after the order of Melchizedek. Um, no, <laughs> Melchizedek is Jesus. Here's the proof. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, 
Read that back there in Genesis chapter 14, King of Salem. Priest of the Most High God. Okay, um, verse 20. Even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So the wording there, you know, it's you could you know think in your mind, well, Melchizedek must be somebody, and then Jesus is the priest after that order of Melchizedek. No, it's Jesus Christ is the priest after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus Christ is Melchizedek, in other words. Priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. What we read about there in Genesis chapter 14, verses 18 through 20. To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Notice it's all capital K. King. Hmm. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 14 through 16. That thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times, whose times? Lord Jesus Christ's times. Which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings, and Lord of Lords. Is there more than one king? Some mysterious guy called Melchizedek that's up in heaven and whatever. Uh-uh. It's Jesus. He is King of Kings. So when you read over there, King of Salem, King of Righteousness, King of Peace, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 2, it can only be talking about Jesus Christ. How do you know? He's the only potentate. Potentate meaning ruler or king, authority, whatever. He's the only one. But look at verse 16. This is a good one. Here in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Who only hath the immortality. Jesus is the only one with immortality? Uh, what's that do for the Father, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit? If Jesus is the only one with immortality. Hmm. If they're separate beings, separate persons, then I guess they don't have immortality. Well, you just read there, who only hath immortality. Context is Lord Jesus Christ. Dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Uh, what is that light? What's it talking about? The soul? Um, who is it that no man's seen? Uh, that would be God the Father. Nor can see. Hmm. And Jesus dwells in that light. Very interesting. And Jesus only has immortality. And Jesus is the blessed and only potentate. They're one and the same being. And before one of you devil-possessed liars comes out and says, Denlinger rejects that Jesus is the Son of God. Shut your stupid mouth. Okay? I get so sick and tired of that. People can lie about me and I'm not supposed to get upset about it and whatever else. You know, it's called libel and slander. All right? I have never said that Jesus is not the Son of God. He is the Son of God, and He is also God the Father. It's one being. All right? I'm going to prove it to you with the next verse. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 3. Go back there. Hmm. Here's where the Trinitarian philosophy that comes from pagan Catholics, uh, this is where it trips people up. This is why they say, it can't be Jesus. This, this Melchizedek guy can't be Jesus. Even though chapter 6, verse 20 says it's Jesus. It says Melchizedek is Jesus. But they'll get to verse 3 of chapter 7 and they say, well, I don't think it could be Jesus. And they kind of back away. Oh, I don't know. Ruckman's reference Bible, Ruckman commentary Bible or whatever else, he literally says, I don't know who it is. I just have to sign out and say, you know, ich weiß nicht. You know, I know not, essentially. Just read English, Ruckman, and drop your Trinitarian paganism. Okay? And Ruckman taught the Godhead. But then he turns around and he tries to blend Godhead and Trinitarian teaching together, and it doesn't work. And he just made a mess of the thing. But look at verse 3. Okay? We know King that, that Melchizedek is Jesus. But look at this. Without 
father. Hmm. Without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth the priest continually. Oh, now what do we do with this? Because you see, God the Father and Jesus Christ the Son are two separate beings. And yet, verse 3 has attributes of both Father and Son. Hmm, what do we do with this? And I saw David Hoffman, the uh, Common Man's Reference Bible. He tries to make it into the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost had a bodily form, and he was the priest of, after the order of Melchizedek. Chapter 6, verse 20, man, it says Jesus. <laughs> it's right there. But look at this, okay? Without Father. Did Jesus have a Father? Yeah, he did. Did God the Father have a Father? No, he didn't. Without Mother. Did Jesus have a Mother? Yes. Did God the Father have a mother? No. You say, well, it must be God the Father. Keep reading. Without descent. Is that true of the Father and the Son? Yeah, actually. Yeah, they don't have descent. They didn't have children. Technically speaking, Jesus Christ is the begotten Son of God. So I guess technically you could say, yeah, technically he's, it's not the same as him being created, just outright created like you and I were. But you could make some arguments there. Having neither beginning of days, is that true of Jesus Christ and the Father? Yeah, they didn't have beginning of days. They're both eternal. Nor end of life. Uh-oh. Uh, that disqualifies Jesus. Jesus did die on the cross. He didn't just kind of fake it and just kind of close his eyes and whatever, look around, you know. No, he died. He fully died on the cross. Well, then what we're seeing here is we're seeing attributes of both Father and Son in one being, Melchizedek. Hmm. You say, well, no, 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 because you see, this is talking about Melchizedek. Melchizedek was before Jesus Christ was manifest in the flesh. So therefore, these things would have been true. He didn't have a father or a mother in the Old Testament, you see. Yeah, but then it blows the prophecy there, nor end of life. Because he did have end of life when he died on the cross. But what about that last statement, though? But made like unto the Son of God, abideth the priest continually. We know abideth the priest continually lines up with Jesus Christ because he is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. But what about this like unto the Son of God? Does that show up anywhere else in the Bible? Hmm. Turn to the book of Daniel, chapter 3. It's a fascinating study. You know, the Bible is the most amazing book, the most amazing physical thing on this planet, if you believe it if you're born again and you believe it. But this book will just destroy your mind and wreck everything about you if you think that you're smart enough to correct it and if you have to change it and add to it and subtract from it. It'll mess with your head. Daniel chapter 3, verse 24 through 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astonished, and rose up in haste, and spake, and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three, three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Did Jesus Christ have a physical body back before he was born of Mary? Yes, he did. Why? Because he's Melchizedek. Okay, you getting it yet? <laughs> okay. But notice it says, like the Son of God. The only other place in the King James Bible that says that. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 3. Daniel chapter 3, verse 25. Only two places that says, like the Son of God. Like unto the Son of God in the book of Hebrews. Hmm. So he has a physical appearance that's like unto the Son of God. And by the way, um, I find it interesting that the very most evil, most powerful political ruler that's ever lived, Nebuchadnezzar, was actually used of God to speak some prophecy. What does that prove? Uh, it proves that God's in control of everything. God controls it all. God's not upset about the black pope or Pope Francis or Donald Trump or... Uh, you know, Putin or, or name them. 
Doesn't mean anything to him. God's not upset about Satan either. He controls everything. And he says, uh, hey, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, most powerful ruler ever, secular ruler, um, say this. That's going to tie in with New Testament written centuries later. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later. Interesting. Verse 26. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God. Interesting. Verse 25, he says, the fourth there, the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. And then he says, servants of the Most High God. Who's priest of the Most High God? Melchizedek. Who is Melchizedek? Jesus. Who was in the fire? Jesus. Melchizedek. Come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. And the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose body bodies the fire had no power, nor was an hair of their head singed, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word, and yielded their bodies, that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Sent his angel? You say, well, this is just the words of a pagan king. God can control anybody. I have seen, I have literally been in the presence of lost people and heard them speak prophecy. Just out of the blue. I've heard it. I've seen it. Doesn't mean that they're saved, doesn't mean that they're born again and the Holy Spirit's mightily upon them. God can just take anybody and anything and just go, you, speak. Hey, you, you, do this. I want you to do that. I want you to take care of this and whatever. God's in control. Unless you're some kind of pagan atheist that calls yourself a Christian and says, oh, God doesn't control certain things and, and whatever else. You know, I, one of my favorites is these idiot uh, new IFB losers and they'll say the Rothschilds were the ones that put you know Israel back in their land the Jews back in their land the modern day Israel was the Rothschilds creation <laughs> okay uh, who controls the Rothschilds you know keep knocking up there maybe somebody will answer you know <laughs> okay uh, the Lord controls the Rothschilds the Lord controls everything he controls everyone the Bible prophesies Israel would come back to their land they have doesn't matter how they got there, okay, in terms of what things happened with who did this and who signed that and, the, and all this other stuff. God controls it all. God's speaking through Nebuchadnezzar, far more evil, far more powerful than any Rothschild that's ever lived. They just don't get it, though. Well, let's go back to the book of Hebrews, chapter 7. Verse 4 through 14. Now consider how great this man was, Melchizedek in other words, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily, ver verily, they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to make tithes, take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less, Levites, is blessed um, of the better, Melchizedek. And here men that die receive tithes, and, but there he receiveth them, of whom it is witness that he liveth. Jesus Christ lives, by the way. We'll get into that more later. And as I may so say, Levi also who receiveth tithes paid tithes in Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? Let's see what am I reading to here? Verse 14. For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. Hmm. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. Our Lord? Here Israel, our Lord is 
one Lord? Um, who is the priest of Melchizedek? You go back to the Old Testament, who is the Lord? Spoken of predominantly, it's talking about God the Father. Well, why is a Jew, I believe the book of Hebrews is written by Paul, He's Jewish, and then, of course, it's going to be preached by Moses and Elijah in the time of Jacob's trouble. They're Jewish, and they're speaking to Hebrews. I know, very difficult to figure out, but here you have me saying there, uh, verse 14, it is evident that our Lord, our Lord, who's he talking about? The Father and Jesus. But he doesn't say our Lord's, uh, our Lord. Just one. Jesus Christ is both Father and Son, you see. And the Spirit is the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Pretty easy to figure out there. But notice it says there the Lord Jesus, the Lord there, came from Judah. Hmm. What scripture do we have on that one? Turn to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5, beginning in verse 5. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals, the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. I thought he said lion of the tribe of Judah, but a, a lamb appears? Uh-huh. Yeah. Pretty interesting. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. So the Father is on the throne. Jesus Christ the Lamb comes and takes the book out of his hand. Why? Well, because there's some things that need to be fulfilled before they, the soul and the flesh come together. You can see my other studies on that. Uh, let's see, verse 8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. You know, if you have a religious service and there's a book that needs to be opened, who are you going to have do it? Just some one of the regular people out there, the, the laity, you know? Or are you going to have the high priest? Uh, you'd want the high priest, um, Melchizedek, priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, Jesus Christ. Yeah, but you see, because the Bible teaches the Godhead, in Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, then Melchizedek can have attributes of both father and son in one being. Unless you're a Trinitarian. Then that stuff just blows your mind and you have to start saying, um, well, um, uh, I think Melchizedek actually um, uh, uh, could be, uh, we're not really sure, it could be Shem and it could be um, uh, the Holy Spirit. Uh, back to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 15. And it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest. After the similitude of Melchizedek? Yeah. He had a body in the Old Testament. Then he's born of Mary, and now he has a body in the New Testament. That brings, I should say, in the Old Testament, that brings in the New Testament. Let me say it that way. He's born of Mary so that he has corruptible flesh. So he can come and he can shed his blood. But that doesn't mean he was some kind of a not created kind of a misty soul thing or whatever else that just kind of vaporized and went around or something like that. No. He had a body in the Old Testament. Anybody that says differently doesn't know the Scriptures. And again, you know, you can compare that to the thing that, you know, Nebuchadnezzar sees him and he says it's like under the, the form of the fourth is like under the Son of God and then he calls him his angel. 
you know, the angel of God. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 16. Who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. Huh. For he testifieth, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. For the, law being, for the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. Some major scripture tie-ins there. Uh, verse 20, And as much as not without an oath he was made priest. For those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Of course, quoting Psalm 110, you know, Psalm 110 verse 4. Look at this, verse 22. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. Well, we don't really know who Melchizedek is. Just read plain English and drop your Trinitarian paganism, as I've been saying. Verse 23, And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Hmm. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Beautiful verse. Absolutely beautiful. And it's about Shem, because Shem was Melchizedek. Uh, no, it's about Jesus. Okay? Let me show you another verse of Scripture that ties into this thing here. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Yeah. Turn back to Hebrews chapter 7. See, it all just, it, it all meshes right together. I mean, I, I understand why these preachers and things have to, have to you know, scratch their head. We're not really sure who Melchizedek is. I understand why they're saying that. But when you look at these scriptures and you put everything together, you just have to say, well, it's plain. There's really no debate here. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26 through 28. For such an high priest became us, hmm, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. So oh, no, Jesus was a friend of sinners. Oh, that's what the Pharisees said about him. That's what people that hated him said about him. But Jesus had separation standards from the sinners. He didn't want to be around those that used profanity. He didn't want to be around the drunkards or the prostitutes or the whatever. He didn't want to be around them unless they were coming to him to repent. He was there as the great physician. They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick... I come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He wasn't a friend of sinners in the sense of hanging out with them. Absolutely not. He was a friend in the sense of he had a cure for their sin problems. And he has a cure for your sin problem too out there if you're not saved. He's the only cure, as a matter of fact. Verse 27, Who needeth not daily as those high priests who offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once, when he offered up himself. When did Melchizedek offer up himself? That's what the whole chapter is about. Unless you, you know, have to try to pervert it or whatever else and say, well, uh, uh, it's no longer talking about Melchizedek. It's now talking about Jesus. And so, it's talking about Melchizedek. It's what the whole chapter is about. Why? Because Jesus Christ fulfilled that prophecy from the Old Testament. Hmm. He offered up himself. Shem didn't offer up himself. Did the Holy Spirit offer up himself? Well, not in the sense of it was the Holy Spirit that died on the cross, per se. The Holy Spirit was in him. He gave up the ghost when he died. You see? Verse 28. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath, which was since the law, maketh the Son, who is consecrated forevermore. Thou art a priest after the order of Melchizedek. We're not sure who it is. We don't really know. It's just I have to scratch my head and say I'm not really sure who Melchizedek is. 
then you got some serious problems, okay? <laughs> and if you are a hardcore militant uh, Trinitarian, you are lost. I will tell you that. If you're confused on the matter and you blend Godhead teachings with Trinitarian stuff and you try to reconcile it, then you're just confused and you're ignorant on the subject and you really need to shut your mouth, and, okay? Because you're just confusing other people. But if you're a hardcore Trinitarian, you're worshiping a false pagan idol is all that the Trinity is. Not one verse of Scripture for that satanic teaching. First Timothy, First Timothy chapter 3. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Compare that with Hebrews chapter 7, verses 26 through 28. Lines up perfectly. Absolutely perfectly. Jesus Christ is God. Holy, completely God. Don't tear him down to a second member or, well, he's lesser. Well, he's not as good. And, well, he wasn't really created until later on. And, and he's, he, you wicked Trinitarians, tearing Jesus Christ down from the position that he deserves. He is almighty God. And he was there as Melchizedek. And he shares characteristics with the Father. Father and Son, both, both as one. It's right there. I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't get it. Well, you need to be saved, and then spiritual things will make sense to you. 1 John chapter 4. We'll go here last. 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Beloved... Believe not every spirit. I'll put a little addendum on there on YouTube. Okay? Or any other place, any other platform and whatever else out there. Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are going out into the world, like a lot of the devils that attack this ministry. Here, hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Okay? So let me state publicly, for the record, I, Brian Denlinger, do hereby confess and openly, I, I believe and openly confess, I'll say it that way, that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. I, S, is come in the flesh. He is in the flesh in the Old Testament. He is in the flesh in the New Testament. He is in the flesh right now as I'm speaking. And He will be in the flesh in the future. Jesus Christ is in the flesh. He was never created. And anybody that says He's created is a lost devil on their way to hell. And they deserve to burn. Their damnation is just. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Don't you dare, dare change this beloved book. This King James Bible, you wicked new version perverters that are come from the Vatican and say he has come in the flesh. A lot of them do. They say he has come in the flesh. It's disgusting. And so all you false prophets out there, get on camera and, and, and make a confession before men and before God and tell us if you believe and confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Old Testament, New Testament, present time, future, he is come in the flesh. He is Melchizedek, a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. He is Almighty God. And you, if you try to mess with him by coming up with this Trinitarian garbage, then God have mercy on your soul. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world. Therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. You're not very popular, Brother Brian. There's channels out there that are bigger than yet because I'm not of the world. You see? We are of God. He that, heareth, hear the, excuse me, he that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Case closed. Who is Jesus Christ? He is Melchizedek. Who is Melchizedek? Jesus Christ. That settles it. The Bible says so. The Bible identifies him. He fulfilled 
the prophecies and, and everything. Not, I shouldn't even say a prophecy. It's just, it's, it's who he is. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. You know, years and years and years ago, I stood in this very spot and I rebuked this wicked devil, Martin Richling, because he said, I hate to tell you, I hate to tell you this, but Jesus Christ is created. Okay, then you're an antichrist. Die and go to hell. I'm not going to waste any time on you. You know, I have sympathy for lost people out there that have never heard the truth. Okay, so don't say, oh, you're so cold and whatever that you'd wish some guy'd go to hell or whatever else. I don't wish that anybody goes to hell. I'd like to see everybody repent. But those that don't and those that teach false things and attack my Savior Jesus Christ, burn in hell. Just that simple. And now there are other false prophets that are coming out and they're saying, well, he isn't really, it's not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh in the Old Testament. He was kind of created. It's, you know, let's study Christology or some kind of thing like this. Um, no, let's just believe the Bible. Jesus Christ is not created. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. And if you reject that, you're an antichrist. And you deserve what's coming to you. So that's going to be it. Um, don't follow anybody as a Trinitarian. I'm going to tell you that right now. There have been people that have been confused. I used to say the Trinitarian stuff, you know, whatever else. I'm sorry. I repent of that. I was wrong. You understand that? I was wrong. I, Brian Denlinger, have messed up. I've made mistakes. Okay, I'm not too prideful to admit to that. I have been wrong in the past on some of my stands that I took. All right? And I'll stand here before you and admit that. My enemies don't. But uh, you get somebody that starts to say that Jesus Christ was created, that at one point in time he wasn't really in the flesh in the Old Testament and things, and he wasn't really around and whatever else, you're dealing with a lost devil. I'd run away from a ministry like that. So that's going to be it. We will see you in the next video.